It's about pride. It's about legacy. I want to make history in boxing. That's why I'm here. When you want to win something this big, you got to risk it all. But I'm ready, and I prepare myself for a different kind of fight. My whole career has been about chasing Canelo. Undisputed versus Undisputed. It's about to be a party in here. BetMGM's got all the sports betting in one place. And it's live, baby. Ooh, we're placing money lines in real time. We got second half spreads and third set winners as they happen. Overs hitting in extra innings. Live is where the action is at. Can we get these people a promo? There it is. Hey, look, today on Certified, we got a great one, man. Today is uh, like my OG. This man right here paved the way for not all, but every young athlete. Changed the rules for all young athletes in all sports. I'm talking about the special, the one and only Spencer Haywood today came in to certify to chop it up with us. So yeah, y'all check this out. Thank you for coming through, man. Thank you. Thank um, you. I always like to start off uh, by just asking, like, you know, obviously, how, how, how you been, man? What you been up to? I've been healthy. Yeah, And good. I've been good. Uh, life is good. I just came in from the Hall of Fame where I hung out with Dwayne Wade mm -hmm. and Powell. We went and played golf oh, uh, before, which is on that Thursday. And then on Friday, we had all of our events and stuff like that. We talked and just hung out, man. It was, it was, it's different. It is. Yeah. I, I watched you in some of these rooms. I've been fortunate to be uh, part of two Naismith uh, projects to where they're giving out greats and accolades. I was part of, obviously, class of uh, 220. And then came. Yeah, well. Yeah, hey. I see you. I see you. I see you. Hey. Good look. Respect. Good look. Good look. <laughs> yeah. And then I came the following year, and I love, I love, I love, I love all the OGs that come to all of the events. It's a chance to be able to exchange conversation yeah. and knowledge, right? You are the one constant that I see that just floats through the room. I want to know, man, what's your secret, man? Like, you've always. You've always had a certain charismaticness about yourself. You know, where, where does that come from? I guess it comes from uh, Detroit. Uh, you know, because I was born in Mississippi, mm. and I had to leave Mississippi because if I stayed there, I would have been relegated to the cotton field. I'm from a place called Silver City, Mississippi, mm -hmm. and it ain't no silver and it ain't no city, it's just oh. cotton fields. Definitely, definitely. And so when I got to Detroit, they re-educated me and re-changed my whole life because I, Will Robinson saw me as this prize package and he was the coach and the first NC2A Division I black coach in mm. the history of the N, of, uh, NC2A. College. So he saw me at age 15 and says, well, look, I can make this guy into a champion. Mm. And so he... He started off with me in ballet, and I was like, what the hell are you talking about, ballet? You're going at your core. So the, the balance and everything, so I had to go, and, and the next step was I had to spend hours with Dr. Wayne Dyer. He wasn't a doctor at the time, he was just a professor. And so we would go through lessons and speech and everything. So oh it was a whole process of oh like wow. learning and bringing me out of that that mold of this raw talent, a raw person. So, and the whole city of Detroit was like, what if this guy would be the first guy to take us to the class A state champions? Mm. Because the city of Detroit hadn't won the class A state champions in 35 years. Wow. So everybody hopes were on me. So they just polished me up real well and had me going through all of the bookstores and everything, trying to relearn how to read and write, because in Mississippi, there wasn't that possibility. Wow. So I had to start all over again. So I was very polished as a young, young dude, you know? And so we ended up going to the state and we won it. Wow. First time in 35 year, 35 year history. 
And of course, I had Ralph Simpson on that team, who uh, his daughter is India Ari. And so we had, uh, we had like six guys, I think, went wow. pros, either in baseball and football and basketball. I, I, you know, as you sit here and say this, I, I have a very parallel path from coming from real gullible Southern background. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not exposed to a lot. You come to a big city and it's like a big classroom. You get a download. I didn't know that you were, you were being groomed and prepared for, or to be a professional. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? When you start tapping into speech, you know, because down south we got the mumble speech. We got the mumble we speech. We got the mumble mumble. We got the southern drawl. Southern drawl. We got the, drawl we got the southern that. slang. And, yes. and, you know, it's, and sometimes when you're talking fast, because southerners talk fast too. Yeah. I'm listening to you and it's very parallel with my own. And it's crazy because when I got to Chicago, it felt just like what you're saying. It, it, I, I immediately got downloaded to how to survive in this city, what to do, what not to do, where yeah. to go, what not to go. And if you do go over here, these are nine out of 10 times what's gonna happen. Yeah. Um, what are your influences when you get to uh, Detroit? Who's, uh, like you just spoke about ballet. Most, most people in the hood are not doing ballet. Most guys down south, most girls down south, most people down south don't yeah. even probably not even at this time recognizing what ballet is and how it, and how it translates to raw talent and the physical specimen. Yes. Well, uh, the ballet class was something that I didn't want right. to participate in right. because my rest of the team was like, geez, OP, look at this idiot. Perception. And so I didn't want to do it. And one night I was playing, we were playing, just fast forward a second. Okay. We were playing for the gold medal in the 1968 Olympics, mm. and the ball was going out of bounds. We were playing against Yugoslavia. So I started walking the sideline to get the ball, and I, I flashed back, and that was ballet. To your ballet training? My you ballet right training. In? I kept the ballet. I what threw did you it do? in to JoJo White. Came in like JoJo this. White kicked it back to me, and I came off the baseline and dunked it. I was like, Thank ballet. God for ballet. <laughs> Y'all heard it. Y'all heard it. Y'all heard it. Don't let perception, <laughs> don't let perception block block greatness and growth. Block greatness. Ballet. You young players out there that want to focus on your core and how to balance, yo. Ballet. Ballet. You know who taught me uh, or who? Uh, I had a teammate very close to me, uh, uh, actually a dear friend, at the time. Um, Stefan Marbury was a, was a player who introduced dance and ballet. I'm from the South, you know, I'm Sunday yeah. skate ring, I'm break dance, I'm thinking break I dancing. got, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, I can dance, you know what I'm saying? Cause you like, know, I went to Chicago too first. Okay. When I came up. I'm saying this to say that, I didn't know how much ballet was a true art in how it confines to basketball, when you're reaching and all this other everything. stuff. Core strength is everything. Everything. Posting up is all core. All core. It's not legs, it's not up. If, we, if you and I are fighting up top, that's the fight up top. <laughs> The battle is the here. The battle is facts. <laughs> yeah. How are you able to, or were you able to, take the ballet and implement it in a game like basketball? Well, I had been also, because I was a cotton picker mm. in Mississippi. I picked cotton from the time I was four years old until I left. So in cotton, you have your hands, you're picking with both hands, you got a sack that you're dragging, maybe a hundred pounds. A lot of people so don't know thorns are on cotton, so you, know, you, you don't have gloves have. on. Right. So your hands are actually really raw. Raw, and you have, you have a good feel, yeah. because if you can pull that cotton out, you know, it was great. And then my legs had built up so powerful mm. from the cotton, and I was picking from sun up to sun down, which was 12 hours. So all of a sudden, everything, my balance and all of my stuff was coming to, I could see it all, but I couldn't figure out where it was coming from. And it was coming from that cotton field of all these things. So you look at it when you say a higher power, God as we know it, and, and it was such a horrible thing to be picking cotton and working in the field, but God was molding me for 
what I was getting ready to do in basketball at an early age. So you under that sun every day, the sun that melanin hitting down. you, the body swelling. <laughs> body swelling. Oh, shit, you seeing it out there. You, you got to have that. another grit to even be out there. You have to have another grit. So when I got to Detroit and we, we were playing basketball, and they were like, you know, we're going to practice for two and a half hours today. And I was like, cool. That's all? <laughs> so after practice, I would go and practice another three hours. Mm. <laughs> so everybody was like, do he love basketball like that? I was like, this is so much fun. Wow. This is not work. So my life was beginning to like mold right in front of me, you know? And, and, and remember, I came up from Mississippi. I came to Chicago first. Mm. Because Highway 61, you come to gotcha. Chicago first. first. You gotta go over And then uh, my brother saw me and said, well, look, I got to get you out of Chicago because your brothers, my other brothers were there. They had told me that they were rich and when they come down south, they would come down with a new car, mm. say, we got a lot of money, man. When you get up north with me, you're going to be like, okay. So <laughs> I get up there and the car was rented. The money was a fool's money, oh, wow. and they were just drinking and, you know, having a ball. And so my brother, who had been raised in the city, he said, no, you can't live here. So he transferred me from Chicago to Bowling Green mm -hmm. State University. Oh, wow. And from there, he moved me to Detroit for a big tournament, uh, outdoor tournament with Dave, against Dave Bings from the Pistons, yep, Jimmy yep, Walker. Yep. Uh, mm. Jimmy Walker is... Uh, yeah, Jimmy Walker is... Um, is uh, I know exactly where you're going. That's uh, Jalen Rose's <laughs> Jaylen father. Jalen Rose's father. Jalen Rose's father. Yeah, the first big spin in, mm -hmm. in pro basketball. So I was playing against those guys, and I was like, wow, I was 15 years old. And so, mm -hmm. and then they says, well, you know, is the kid this good? And so they said, well, let's play against Cassie Russell, oh, wow. who were from Crane. These are all the, Michigan, these are all the yeah, Michigan boys, right? The Michigan University of Michigan, Bill Buttons and all of them. So they threw me out there against those guys, and I played against them and How old did are you? real well. I was 15. 15 years old, playing yeah. against like, pros. pros. Well, the first time I had the pros against Dave Bing, Reggie mm. Harding, yep. uh, all of those Pistons. And then the next round, I went against the... Uh, the college guys who were like the University of Michigan, Michigan State, so on and so forth. And we were all playing at this outdoor uh, facility called Crump. And then I got around to playing against the high school guys, and I was like, oh. You said it gets, it's at Crunk, right? Yeah. The famous, but, infamous Crunk. Crunk. That's the same Crunk in... in but it's, the indoors is for boxing, yeah, outdoors. the outdoors are for hooping. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, what's up, y'all? KG here. Football season is back, and I can't wait to kick off the action with the King of Sportsbook. This season, take advantage of BetMGM's first bet offer. When you place your first wager on your pro football game using my code KG1500. Yes, KG1500. Yeah, buddy. Register an account and make your first wager. If you lose, you'll get your stack back and bonus bets up to $1,500. Start the pro football season off right with a KG certified and BetMGM. So it's safe to say that these are the these are the people that are not only inspiring you, but these these, these, are, these are motivating parts. These are motivating parts. This is the first time that I was like, she, I had gym shoes on, real shoes on, mm -hmm. because my gym shoes I had, I came up from Mississippi. My shoes were these Converse, and I had um, uh, cardboard paper in my in my shoes because mm -hmm. I had wore the bottom out. So it was your first time in some real canvas, yes. nice comfortable shoes. <laughs> nice comfortable shoes. Were you nervous? Step on the floor with no. a casual wrestle? Step on no, the floor. No, I with didn't even know. I, I I didn't even take it in like that. I was just uh, man. I just wanted to play. Oh wow! And I had got out of the cotton field. Wow! So I just wanted to play ball. So, so your I perspective could... was so such of a gratification and such a a different perspective that, you yeah. know, it sounds like Detroit was just a canvas to just let loose of all these it dreams was. and all this rawness that was inside of you, right? Yeah, because here I am, you know, I'm, I'm coming from 
where you got John Lee Hooker and those people playing a four bar blues by mm. doom, 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 doom. Is that the chicken ch uh, chitlin circuit? Where yeah, a bunch yeah, of jazz just saying, and like, a bunch of No, they wasn't playing blues. jazz, they were just playing blues. Oh, okay. Well, uh, you know, my wife yeah, left yeah, me yeah. and uh, yeah. the dog died, et cetera. Mm. Blah, 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 playing <laughs> doom, doom, doom. Yeah. And so I get to Detroit, and then you got, I bet you're wondering how I look. The Motown, you got mm, that whole up, sound. I was up. like looking around, mm. like, whoa. The people doing the cha cha and they <laughs> dancing to it, yeah. <laughs> yes, so it was a different world for me, you know? Vibe, yeah. But I was just taking it all in. And so then Will put me into all those classes and had me in speech class and all this. And I'm trying to figure out why are you doing all of this stuff? And he said, you're going to be the one mm. that's going to liberate this city mm. and I'm going to train you to be a pro player. And I was like, a pro basketball player? Uh. I hadn't seen the pro players, but I had just played against them in this pickup. And I was like, yeah, I think I'll be a pro. He was curating you. Yeah. A lot of people don't know, man. Um, a lot of people do know this. Uh, Spencer Haywood in 68 won a very, very predominant case against the government. That no, wasn't in 68. It wasn't in 68? It was 1970. It's 1970. 70. I filed suit in 1970 against the NBA because I wanted to play. Well, let me just back up for a second, if I may. I was playing with Denver, and what happened with the Denver team was it was an ABA team. Mm. And so the Denver team in the ABA, Hannah Storm's father, Mike Storm, says, well, you know, we didn't get Kareem in the draft to come over to the ABA. Kareem went to NBA. Milwaukee. Milwaukee. So they came after me and said, well, look, your, your family is poor and in Mississippi. You know, let, you can be the first one to leave college early and play in the pros. I was like, you gonna pay? So I left after my sophomore year. Mm. And even though I was an All-American first team with Kareem, Pete, Pete Maravich, Calvin Murphy, all of us was on the first team All-American mm. team in college. So I left and went to the ABA and the ABA says, well, this gamut would work if you can get seven points and five rebounds a game for this season and this would be a good move for us. And we can then usurp the draft and get all the young guys to come into the ABA mm. before they go into the So they were trying to use it as a leveraging tool. A leveraging agree, right? tool. So I went in there and I have 30 points mm. and 19.5 rebounds. Hell with your seven points, right. You can yeah. have your seven points. You can have that seven. Talking about. I'm right. talking real ball Fuck, here. Right. I'm a cotton picker, man. Right. This ain't no work. This is work. <laughs> <laughs> this is work, Oops. man. Oops. I, I want to work. What are you talking <laughs> so, about? So I, I bust out that season, and then I was the MVP, Rookie of the Year, leading scorer, leading rebounder, MVP of the All-Star Game, 19 years old, just turned 20. And so I went into the ownership, and we said, well, look, they said, we're going to give you a contract. So they gave me a fraudulent contract, a Bernie Madoff contract, where I was going to get my bulk of my money oh, from fuck. AIDS. No from age 50 to age 70, what? providing if I would stay with the company and drive trucks. I know, it's okay. insane. So I, then I get this. sounds like a Jim Crow deal. That this was, was a Jim Crow deal for sure. Super Jim Crow and deal. And it's going to get deeper. Oh, so wow. I said, well, oh, my God, I didn't have an attorney. I was like just a young guy world. taking everything in and believing that they were oh, wow. going to take care of me. So I go get word. this lawyer. So Al Ross come in, he's my young Jewish lawyer, he come in, I'll straighten this shit out, you know, I got this. So we go into the office with the owners of the team who are these truckers, the Denver Rockets who are Rocket Service, which is the Denver Nuggets today. So we go in and we sit down and we're like, yeah, we like to straighten this contract up and we like to do this. So the, the owner sat there and he looked at us and he said, I tell you what I want you two sons of bitches to do. Spencer, you take your nigger ass out of here and take that Jew ass lawyer with you. Get out of my office. You can't go back to college 
because you're ineligible. You can't go to the NBA because you can't, you're an underclassman, so you're stuck with me. This is to Mr. Storm. This is what he said to you. No, that Mr. Storm, Hannah Storm's dad, he was, he was the agent who put us all together. Oh. This was J.W. Ringsby who owned oh. the Denver Rockets. Mm. And he owned a franchise wow. here. So then Sam Schumann, who owned the Seattle Supersonics, and Jerry Colangelo, who owned the, the Phoenix, Phoenix Suns, Suns yeah. they had the idea, we're going to, because the ABA was rating the NBA with players, so they said, let's rate the ABA guys. Every time they get an MVP, we're going to steal him and bring him to the NBA. Mm. But the one problem with me, they got Connie Hawkins to, to go to Phoenix, mm -hmm. and then I was the next MVP, so I was on the class still. I had one more year left. Oh, Sam yeah. Schulman said, you know, what are we going to do? And I said, I want to play. And Sam Schulman said, well, I'm going to teach you about Jewish loyalty. I'm going to put up the finance for your case all the way through. And I don't care how far it go, we're going to fight this. So I was like, great. Oh, wow. So I filed suit, and I signed with Seattle. They gave me a real contract. I, I filed suit for the rights to play in the NBA mm. and against the NC2A because the NC2A was under the banner, like, right. you know, he's stealing all of our, they're going to steal all of our economics and everything from players because they're going to go from college or high school to the pros, and we're not going to make any money anymore. So that was a big deal. Wow. And so the NBA was like, we'll put up a good front and we, because we don't want to like the public to be angry with the NBA. So they file, I, when I file suit, they file suit against me and they jammed me for the first 10 games. I had to sit home and just practice and do this. And so, out. We had to sit yeah, out. so the next 10 games, I got in, they were like, the first game I got in, it was like, ladies and gentlemen, we have an illegal player on the floor, number Damn. 24. This how, they, this how they did you? Yeah, and I was like, what? I'm not illegal, <laughs> I'm here. Fuck. <laughs> and so. <laughs> on the mic. On the mic. And so, and this game is being played under protest, so. I played the game, wow. and the game was under protest. So all of my first 10 games were under protest. Maybe it would count, it would count, and maybe not. And then they got an injunction again for another 10 games I had to sit out. Then the next 10 games, I got an injunction to play again. We get to Cincinnati, and they said, guess what, ladies and gentlemen, we got an injunction tonight. And they said, this injunction read, he must be outside of the, the grounds in which this arena sat on. So they put me out into the snow. Oh, wow. So I stayed out in the snow and I almost froze. And uh, then I got on the bus and left and, and had another 10 games. Then I got another 10 games. Next time we were in Chicago, Chet Walker is warming up on the other end. And the owners of the Chicago Bulls said, act as if you got hurt. So Chet said, oh my God, my, my ankle is hurt. And so the next morning I get up and they sued me for $600,000. Why? Because he said he tripped on his ankle while I was warming up on the other end. So they're playing all these games with All you kinds of games. So wow. I, the, the case maneuvered its way all the way to the Supreme Court. And when it got to the Supreme Court, Thurgood Marshall was on the court. He was one of the justices on the court, and he kept saying, you know, it's ironic this case is not affecting tennis players, hockey players, baseball players, and he kept going on with different sports. And he said, man, now, ironically, it's only the two revenue sports in college that this rule is affecting. And so, he said, you know, we're sending our soldiers to Vietnam mm. at age 18. They're coming back maimed and, and hurt and sick and dying. But yet, you got a player whose mother is picking cotton in Silver City, Mississippi for $2 a day. My mother was at that time. Mm. 
but yet he makes all, he make all of this money for the Olympics. He made all of this money for the university. He made all of this money for the ABA, and yet he can't make a living in the NBA. And so that's when the justice got together and they said, they came back seven to two in favor of me. Oh, wow. And that's when the case was over, wow. March 1st, 1971. Wow. And then the next round was, uh, let's go play. Because the union didn't support me. So wow. everybody was, I was out alone by myself doing this whole process. And so then we started playing and we got to Milwaukee and Kareem where normally every team would go downstairs and stay downstairs and make me sweat upstairs by myself and people throw bottles and stuff. These are real bottles back in those days, you know, not that plastic stuff. Mm. <laughs> so I would like to stand there, yeah, I'm the man, you know, and Kareem wouldn't go down. So we stood, up, we stood in the middle of the floor just kicking it, you know? Wow. And so everybody came up from the Bucks and then we started playing. Wow. And that's when everything said, everybody said, damn, this guy is ready to play. And let's get ready for the young guys coming in because they are going to come. And then the NBA says, you know what? This is a great thing for us because now we have, we have a chance to expand and grow. Because before they had four years of waiting outside, you know, after high school, you had to wait four years before you could come into the end. That was to help college grow. They was growing yep. the college game. College players never ever thought about having their own rights. No never rights. ever thought about having anything. Didn't even know how to start negotiating or even start that conversation. We weren't equipped for that. Right. But yet they owned your rights for four years and they four made years. money on you for four years. And how dare you ask for anything? And You're don't you an have, education. You don't even ask for a hamburger. Facts. Meanwhile, <laughs> numbers don't lie. Numbers don't lie. Are you, are you tapped in with the NIL? Are you following what's going on in college Yeah, because stuff? that was another thing that uh, the courts brought out at that yeah. time. Uh, Thurgood Marshall was, was mentioning the fact that we can no longer allow college athletes and predominantly black athletes in the two sports, which is basketball and football, football. Yeah. to basically pick cotton and not get anything. The families back home don't get anything. And the car dealers, they have all of the, they make all of the money. The restaurant tours, if you're just saying like Tuscaloosa or the Alabama. Little towns. The, the towns, the towns of business, yeah. Yeah, they, they grow. The towel boy, which is, he makes 150,000 a year. And the players who are doing all the work, everything, nothing, nothing. They get a Pell Grant. I heard you get you get an education. Meanwhile, ten minutes down the street, they just built a goddamn football stadium that holds one hundred and twenty thousand. <laughs> Don't tell me you're building that off for like off off Swiss cheese and no no and encyclopedias the, the and back. dictionaries, yeah. bro. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, we should yeah. be saying it. So uh, we need to be in on on the lawmaking. We need to maker. understand our so power. So the NIL Bro. came to me, and they, they are talking, and um, Gus Johnson on Fox, mm -hmm. he did a special about Spencer Haywood rule is the reason we have NIL yeah, today. today. Yep. Because I, I refuse to continue to play. And so it opened up the, all of those doors. So the NIL now is like you see Bronny and... Those guys are getting paid. College athletes are getting paid. My daughters were, were basketball players in college, but they didn't, you know, we had this, you know, they, they are now getting play, paid. Mm. You see, the, not my daughters, but the girls from LSU, yeah. uh, from our state. Yeah, Iowa. Uh, yeah, right. they're getting, I mean, it's like you're making a living because that's what you're doing. Yeah. And you're getting an education. And the educational value was diluted since 1956. It was put in as a gimmick. Hmm. In 1956, we said, all college athletes, we are, we're going to make it available for use because of strictly for the educational value. But yet, I would think, I think it was 78% of the players were not graduating because you didn't have time. You got 
practice. Mm. You have class. all your classes. You got uh, events you have to participate in. You have to go to fundraisers for the university and all of these things. So you wasn't being educated. So it was just a fake fantasy. How far are we from player union for college? How far are we from that? We, uh, we should be getting a union maybe in another year or two right. because you have players who are getting hurt and they can't, uh, football players, they get hurt and basketball players are getting hurt. Yeah. And no they can't have no insurance. No nothing, no, no life no, plan. No I life know. plan, no nothing. Yeah, no, no. So you got to have a union to yeah. protect them. Yeah. And the universities are holding on to that last Man, that vestige of that leverage. Uh, of leverage, you know? How far are we uh, also, just about college, because I'm so fascinated with how long this has been going on without disruption and no one wanting to really disrupt the pattern, right? Mm -hmm. But comes change, comes disruption. Someone has to be the, uh, the, the elder statesman for something, right? Yeah. I do know between 65 and 75, 1965 and 1975, groups, community groups, uh, people are speaking out, people are outraged, coming back from war, the times in that time. No one's thinking about going up against the NBA. No one thinks to take the challenge to be the first who inspired you, or what is the inspiration behind that thought alone? Well, what happened, I mean... Did it you was, look at it like that? Huh? Did you look at it like that? No, I was looking at it as if I was have one goal in mind. My mother and our family had been picking this cotton mm. and living in slavery, indentured slavery here right, right. for all of these years and my mother's back had went out. So she was crawling on the, on, the, on the ground and picking cotton from the dirt and from the stalk and putting it in a sack, but she could barely drag the sack, so she pulls it up a little bit, and then she picks some more, and then she pulls it up a little bit more. So my whole idea was just, I gotta get my mother out of this cotton field. Wow. Because she's going to die Fox. if I don't. Fox. So that was my whole process. But then on the other end, uh, you know, I'm from Detroit, so you had all the revolutionary people, man, brother, you getting down, you're gonna make it happen, right. you're gonna do this. And so I kind of right. got caught up in it. And then when I was going through the case, I, I approached Wilt and I said, cause I was playing against him in the Lakers one night. And I said, Wilt, why, why didn't you, uh, you left college early why didn't you fight the NBA so I didn't have to have this fight? He says, because I'm not as stupid as you. <laughs> Will played alone. He played the he said, Will played he alone. Said, Will said, I had one more year, I went to the Globetrotters, yeah. and I came into the NBA. And he was saying it as jokingly, you know what I mean? He also but had he was counsel. Proud. He had counsel. He had, counsel. he had great counsel. He had a Jewish lawyer giving him plays, giving him hey, taps in. there you go. Uh, people don't know that, man. I learned a lot on the Will. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to the Will Chamberlain family, man. Yes, you know what man. I'm saying? Make sure y'all catch that Will man. Doc out there, too. It's a good and that's Will a great Doc. doc. You, like, you, you did a great that? job, yes. What did we miss on the Will Doc that you know? Or what would you say that, if anything, if we missed anything that you know that wasn't in the Doc? Well, you took care of everything. I mean, it was like you had Sonny Hill, you had all of those I, people from... People don't know how big Sonny is. If you were looking for a historian... I mean, with, Sonny with, Hill. Sonny Hill. If you ever are in the Philadelphia area and you get a chance to go to any Sixer game, yeah. and you're a fan, tap Sonny Hill. You're going to know who Sonny Hill is, too. He looks like no other in the gym. And Sonny was the first black announcer that really came mm. out of the, you know, he came was on CBS. He, he, came was like, with he came with it. He was talking real basketball. Because before, you know, you had guys who were talking basketball, but it was like... Journalists. Journalists, and they were scientific, you know. And Sonny was like, no, this is happening. This Breaking is what's going on. This is what's going on in the locker room, so on and so forth. Mm. So that, that doc was like just tremendous in the aspect of, of Will. And the part that, I don't know if you missed it, but Will was part of the Naismith 
Naismith, you know, our, our yeah. Hall of Fame, yeah. because he went to the University of Kansas. Kansas yeah. And my coach in my first year with Denver was John McLendon, mm -hmm. who was the first black coach as well over there. Mm -hmm. And he was from the school of Kansas with Dr. Naismith. Okay. So it was just, wow. it was bringing up all this beautiful history to me, just watching the Wilt story and just like, people don't understand. I played against Wilt. Wow. How dominant, how great he was wow. as a player. That's and that's why sometimes when people start talking about the GOAT, I'm like, oh Lord, that's a conversation. <laughs> It's a big pot of stew conversation. People think it's just this little, just this little, little small. bitty. <laughs> and the pot of goat is a huge conversation with a bunch in it. With a bunch of goats flying up out of it, and jumping you know, up and down, and, and you, you know? You know it's I, like bubbles <laughs> in the soup. You know, one of the things um, you don't get enough credit for, to me, mm. is uh, your style. You know, I say this uh, in all due respects that everybody that's ever played in the league, I call face up, the face up, the grasshopper yeah. or the praying mantis. And you will understand when you see the face up. Mm -hmm. And working from the face up, if you have speed, if you have athleticism and agility, it's, it's, it's you already know this, it's quantum ways of, of, of just on each block. It don't even matter. You can take the same things for the elbows of the, of the um, free throw line yeah. and work the same way. I'm saying this to say that uh, Sigma, uh, uh, Jack, Sigma. Jack Sigma, very famous for the face up. Face up. To hit you, have pump face with the, with the lower body, never move. Like, like, I'm going into the science of basketball right here, so just, just, just bear with me, yeah. right? Sigma probably had the coldest uh, face up from the big, from the post, and from anywhere on the court that I've seen. And you're, I put you and Jack Sigma like, right here. I just want to know what was your um, inspiration off the face up? Like I knew you had a bunch, a lot of people know your hands too, yeah. you know, <laughs> Connie, y'all was real <laughs> man, you know? Um, yeah. So I'm going more into, I don't think you get enough credit for the, the, the credit for being the big who faced up, yeah. worked off the one dribble, could come middle hook you both right. ways, step, like off the glass, like a lot of people don't, don't tap into more of where these moves are coming from. As a historian and being able to put different things in your game, you gotta know who was what. Kareem with the sweeping, right? He was using a bunch of namaste and yoga moves that was actually elongating him. I'm going to the sciences, so keep up if you watch watching Back this, to the right? ballet and the yoga so again. Here we go writers, again. So I'm saying this to say, this, these, all these things go in to this Where'd you, where'd you pick up on Grasshopper? Where'd you pick up on Praying Mantis? Like, or, or you just playing? You, you know, boom, you, you bat, you, oh, you face. You know, like, like, take me through where you getting some of your influence when it comes to the play of. Well, the, the first influence, major influence, was a coach okay. named Lenny Wilkins, mm. and who was a player coach. Yeah. We played yeah. together, yeah. but he was my coach. And he would always say, I don't want you down here just in one position because you can't, you can't make but one or two moves. I want you to face up and you keep the ball similar. So Jack Sigma and I are coached by the same Lenny Wilkins. <laughs> I know this basketball world is so Fuck small. Fucking science, boy. I know this shit, boy. You hear what I'm saying to you? I'm from the fu this shit is man, so this crazy. This is crazy. I just, I didn't even know none of that. I put, you, man, bro. Yeah. I apologize. Keep going. Okay. So man, you're certified a day. So boy. here's you Lenny. A day, boy. So. My first game mm. in Seattle. I get it now, the Seattle when the Sonics I were. Oh, man, the I Sonics, got it. When I came with the Sonics, so I, I ripped the ball off the backboard. I kicked it out to Lenny, and Lenny was like dribbling. He said, and I said, oh, okay. And he kicked it to me, and I was at the free throw line, so I just said, well, what the hell? So I just took off and floated in there, dunked, and I turned around, looked at the audience, said, yeah, let's go. And they said, He's a hot dog, isn't he? <laughs> and they kept saying, hot dog, hot dog. Oh. And so the next game, they were like waiting. 
Show us something. <laughs> oh, do something. Man, do something hot, dog. Do something. <laughs> do something hot, dog. So I did some more ah. stuff. So then all of a sudden, the fans in Seattle was like, we love this style oh. of play. So I moved out from underneath the basket and let the center play down low. And I started facing up. When I got the ball, I faced up, look around. I had like four or five different angles. Right. And Lenny was, we would stay after practice. We'd work on the Conway. angles. And you can go here, you can go here, you can go. All of these spots, you got to know where the science of the game is, where the floor is. So we were hitting those spots. And that's when I said, yeah. Wow. And he would always say, don't bring it down to your waist because you got, you don't know, you got Chris Paul and those guys swiping at you. So keep it up around here. And you can also shoot it while you're up here. You can keep it right here and just shoot it. So. How long did it take you to master? Well, I stayed in the gym for hours. And no, I know that. He was like, I know that. I know he that. Said, he said, damn, I. I thought we was going to work for an hour, and I stayed for two, three hours because I wanted this thing so bad, and I was just, you know, when you are learning from a master, you just can't, you just, you just don't want to let it go. You want to, like, take it all in. You want to suck it in some more and some more. You want to just keep eating and eating and eating. My stomach is full, but I, I just want to blow up. <laughs> so I stayed in the gym. I love that. I totally love that, man. Like, as you're sitting here talking, like I'm sitting up here thinking like, you know, sometimes you think that you're a little different. At least I, at least I could see that. We've so much alike. So much, so much. We, we, we always say this. We, we are this. so no, much. No bullshit. You know, I, yeah. you know I, I, I obviously didn't go through the type of background that you went through with. But, um, you know, growing up in the South, you got to have a certain pedigree. Yeah. Got to have a certain, um, and living down South makes you, makes you tough. It makes you... Um, Makes you weathered, you know what I'm saying? I like to think that when I moved up north, I was prepared. Uh, I had a certain level of confidence about myself. I wasn't no showman or none of that. But I like to think that the city brings another level of not just this, this raw uh, talent that's in you, but yeah. bro, I, the energy, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like I, like I can remember just being in Chicago and how everybody was just fascinated, not just on the ability to run all day, but yeah. my energy levels were different from everybody's. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, I studied... Um, and did you ever think when you, when you was up, you know, when you came up, you was, oh, man, these city boys. <laughs> I'm on... I, I'm used on. To, I used to dream a lot. Yeah. And I used to go to these little tournaments, and then these tournaments would be, you know, Chicago, it would be L.A., it would LA. be... New York, it would Detroit, be Detroit. Detroit. It'd be my, you know, at the time, because I'm in, I'm in Green, I'm in South Carolina, so you get a bunch of Atlanta, Charlotte, Virginia. You get a bunch of Miami, Orlando, mm -hmm. and these Southern boys. Sometimes you get the Texas boys, Florida boys, crazy Texas boys, run and jump, like you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. But then you start kind of, you know, and um, I would always look forward to playing city, city guys. Like when I played New York, New York guys was always talking. Talking. New York guys was talking. Yes, and they was talking in riddles. And <laughs> yeah, New York, New York guards was like something I never seen in life. Like spinning, dropping. New York guards was dribbling up and down the street. They was talking to the bums. They was hollering at the chick. They was slapping yes. by with the construction workers. They were just, and it was just. Uh, it, I was like, man, what in the fuck am I looking at? Yeah, yeah. yeah son, and it was Jan B, and there was Jan Thun, and. And, I was and, playing with one of those bro, New York I was, guards. I was so fascinated, bro. <laughs> yeah. And, and the yin and the yang. I always yeah. like to call it the country mouse and the city mouse. Yes. A real story and yeah. a real continuity and, and, and connection. But I always loved to play against the city guys because they talked the most shit. And they had all the they had all the jazz, you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. the city, city kids had all that, yeah, son, yeah, come on here, oh, draws, you know, had, yeah, had like, yep, you know what I'm saying? Yep, yep, had yep. all the Man, I'll just shut up and play. I didn't, shut up I, and play. Because the coaches and how you was raised right. in the South. You didn't showboat. You, you showboat. rebound the ball. You get the ball. You get to the point guard. You run down like you. I was so shocked at it's the work. freedom that the, the Northerners had. Yeah. I got up, I got up to Chicago, and, 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 and Mama was talking back to the coach, and Woo. might tell the coach, shut up. And I'll be like, no, no, boy, no. You know, I would have got, you would have, your lips would have been bleeding. So... In that, <laughs> I, know, I know we all know. Your lips 
I know we all over the place. I'm saying this to say that. <laughs> yes. It, it, the 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 freedom. Yeah. And I guess the you know what I would say the southern um, respect that you are raised with. Yeah. For your mom, your father, your grandmother, mm-hmm. your grandfather, your family. No sir. Yes sir. Yes ma'am. No ma'am. But I found out a lot of these kids up north are living on their own outside. They exactly. don't have no place. And they're their mom. They're the granddad. They're exactly. the Exactly. They are the they are it. They're the breadwinner in their house. Right. And it changed my philosophy and it changed my perspective to not not judge you from sitting right, right here, but man, I can't believe you doing this, bro. At, at, at the same age that we're doing this. Talk yeah. about a little bit of what Detroit taught you from a street perspective that you carried on into your everyday life or you carried into the league with you? Well, I mean, Detroit taught me the, those fundamentals because also Will let me sit with the judges, go to the courtroom. Mm. This is in high school. Wow. I mean, like going to meet up with judges and I was clerking a little bit and, and I'm learning the law. I was learning the music because uh, Melvin Franklin was like a big booster for me. He's with the Temptations. Mm. And they would like bring me over to Motown and I would sit in Motown watching all of them and listening to David Ruffin sing, wow. Smokey Robinson and all these wow. people. I was just, he was, he opened up so many doors and to, to hear uh, all of those people at the big orchestra in the basement mm. at Motown where they're just playing and and before they go into the tune, they, they're tuning up the acts and everything you had. You're talking about a bass player, you had that doo-doo, doo-doo, the, the one with uh, the Temptations. Doo-doo, doo-doo. doo-doo. Yeah, I know exactly yeah. what that is. Yeah. That I mean, first sound, that was the first Motown sound, eh? Yes. So you was around when that first was thing was being I was in the studio. Ooh, what was that like? That stuff was Ooh, like so sh- awesome, my God. And then. Then there was one, so much shit digging going on in that yes, thing, boy. man. And then, then one night, we, we got on the bus, and we rode from Koenig Gardens down to uh, the Fox Theater. The Fox Theater had Smokey Robinson. They had... Um, Sam Cooke, all of them? Up no, there. it was just uh, Motown. Oh, just all the Detroit guys? Mo- uh, Stevie Wonder. Oh, he was young Stevie Wonder. Mm. He was like little Stevie then. That's when he was young. Tap- yeah, he was... Yeah, he, did. yeah, he was like my age. He was like 16. He a was, prodigy. He was yeah. playing that. That's where he could sing and play the Yeah, play yeah, yeah. yeah, the harmonica. Yeah, the harmonica. And stuff. So yeah, yeah. I was just fascinated by going into the wow. Fox Theater and paying a dollar and watching all of these acts for a dollar and just looking at the, the music and we were sitting way up high, you know, it wasn't down at the Fox, but That's why that shit was a dollar. <laughs> 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 so you're sitting there, you're listening to all of these great musicians, and you're like, wow. wow. Because I, I, the only person that I had seen before that was, um, they came to this, this school at McNair High School where I was before I got to Detroit. Mm. They had Howlin' Wolf, Jimmy Reed, mm. and B.B. Um, King. They was on this tour bus, and they took Highway 49W in Mississippi, and they stopped in in Belzoni, and they stopped by the high school, and they gave us a, 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 a you know, like a commencement a show, exercise, a show. A a show. show. Oh, wow. And that shit blew my mind. I was like, wow, I want to be a musician. So I asked my mother, can I get a, a saxophone lessons? And it cost 50 cents. She said, you better go back to the field, boy. Right. Sure <laughs> you ain't got no 50 you cents. <laughs> you been back to Detroit lately? Yes, I'm going back to Detroit uh, on uh, this weekend. I'm going to play in Mark Wahlberg's golf tournament. Your thoughts on it? And then, regentrified, re, re, different look. What's yeah. your thoughts? Well, my thoughts are uh, I invested in Detroit with Coleman A. Young back in 1992. I built an apartment complex along with two other partners, nice. and the stuff then blew up ridiculously, and. I was just there, and I mean, Detroit is... It's on its way. Yeah, it's It's on on its way. way. And it's about time, too. And it took, you know, I guess white and black came together to make that city for what it is and what it was and now what it's going to be. So 
Detroit is pretty serious place. Oh, it's the one city that you have on the water, on the, on the, and on the other side, you got another city and another country, Windsor. Mm. Yeah, that's beautiful. the Canadian joint, yeah. Yeah. They mirror each other, almost like twin cities almost, Twin right? cities, yeah. yeah. It's just, it's an opportunity to village. You following the Pistons? Yeah. I My like dad used to, Will Robinson was the scout and the assistant to the general manager there for 30 years? Yeah. Yeah, he brought Joe Dumas, mm. Isaiah, all of those guys were Will Robinson boys. I love it that they got downtown being where you come to watch the games. When That's real Detroit. We would always play in... Out in, in the, Auburn, uh, in Auburn And you would never get to really feel like you was in Detroit. You know what I'm saying? At least now you feel like, you know, you're, you're like this feels Detroit. Yeah, but let me flash back to the old days of Detroit when we used to play at Cobo Hall mm. downtown. It was a, flash, a fashion show, pimp show. Mm. Everybody, it was... It was who's who. It was who's who. And then you had all of the musicians. Everybody came in. It was I'm really glad so. you said this, because this segues into this. Yeah. Smith, so are you following with the league of the in-game tournament? Have you heard of this? Yes. So this is kind of the commissioner's cup, I guess, the league's way of having a commissioner's cup. Mm -hmm. You know what I threw at Adam? The in-game tournament needs to be just that. It needs to be the who's of who. It needs to be a fucking show. The red carpet, who, who dressed tonight? It needs to be like when we watching the Oscars. It needs to be who's, who's front row, who's in the town. It needs to be like a boxing joint. You know how boxing come in for? You know what I mean? Yes. Money may bring everybody out and everybody come out with the, ah. You know what I'm saying? If it's Bud Crawford and Spence and they, ah. You know? Yeah. Like that's what the end game joint. Give me your views or give me your thoughts. It's, on, in, it's in Las Vegas. It's in Vegas. So, you you know, it's in Vegas. You got to go big you, in Vegas, right? You have right? to go big. Tell me your views on it. You think it's good for the game? You oh, like it? Yes. You know? All of this is good for the game. And I love basketball today. Facts. I just, I mean, to see where it came from and to where it is today, I love all of it. And when I was being talked about coming on your show, I mentioned it to Adam up at the Hall of Fame. He said, that's your guy, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> he said, KG is your guy. No, Adam's good people, he's man. Gonna have, he's going to have, he's going to, it's going to be a good show. Adam, Adam's good and people, he, man. And he was praying for us to get together and do this show. Up, and he is one of the guys who are working behind the scenes, and he's telling me to just be cool for a minute because he wants to put my name on my rule so that all the players will know mm -hmm. that it is the Spencer Haywood rule that they are playing under. Because, you, you know, 90% of the players today in the NBA are playing under this rule and don't even know it. Wow. So that he's going to put the name on it. We should put that in Naismith. It needs yes. to be on the side of the wall just for... Well, they got it in the Naismith. No, it needs to be to where we can see it. See it, it's yeah. Amplified yeah. with a screen. With or, some, or some digital shit where you can read it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? We need to... Remember that Han Solo? Y'all remember Star Wars when Han Solo was encased in ice? What was that? Nitrogen or some shit? We need to put the Spencer <laughs> Haywood rule up like that. Y'all yeah. laughing. I'm dead ass. You know, that rule has created over $50 billion in players' revenue over the, since 1971 until now. Wow. And then think about all the greats that come out of that. All of the greats. All of them. So, Magic, Jordan, you, all y'all. Cold. You're cold, man. T Mac. T Mac. Dwight Howard. Dwight Howard. Braun. <laughs> think about, think about wow. all of it, right? Yeah. Um, when you watch today's game, players today, what player reminds you of yourself? I. Or mirrors. Or when you see it from your perspective, you go, hmm, <laughs> that look like me. Giannis. Really? Yeah. I had a better shot, mm. outside shot. Mm. But Giannis, because I was long, I could reach, and I could do that. And you dunking that motherfucker. And I was dunking. <laughs> ain't, ain't no laying up nothing. <laughs> nothing. Everybody need to know, no, Spencer so Haywood, Kareem. put this on your motherfucking head. So here's Kareem in 1980, which, you know, was a crazy year for me. But yeah. in 80, 1980, so me and Kareem, uh, and we are working on this guy, Hook. So, and I keep telling Kareem, if I get this, this close, 
I'm going to dunk it. Like, fuck all this finesse. Yeah. <laughs> And he was like, you know, you could put some years on your mm. on your on your career. He was talking about the impact of the it. The impact eh? and put yeah. some years on the career, but I never did listen because I was getting high that year. So mm. <laughs> I gotta was I'm glad you brought it up. Yeah. Are you watching Winning Time? Yeah. Yeah. So when we when I found out you was gonna be on the show, <laughs> I got a partner. And me and my partner were so because we're enthusiasts on on TV and all the stories that come out. There's yeah. very few people that can file claim to what's true and what's not or what's there. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I didn't anticipate magic or anybody. I, I did anticipate like the Lakers and Jenny Buster to come out or whatever and or kind of get in front of it. Mm -hmm. Because if you've been in the league and you know Dr. Bus, you know that you know Dr. Bus has a reputation. If you know anything about, about Dr. Bus in LA, you know. You know, you know what I'm saying? Okay. So when I was watching Winning Time off of what I know, yeah. it was all looking accurate off of what I know. Is Winning Time accurate? In my case, very accurate. Man. And... Um, literally. Literally. <laughs> yeah, it was very accurate. And I got a chance to talk with the actor that was portrayed portraying me, okay, cool. uh, Wood Harris. And Wood said, I will not do any harm to you. I will do right by you. And then I saw him with Matt Burns on All the Smoke, and he said, I'm going to take care of him. One of my favorite, if not favorite actors in Hollywood, Wood Harris. Wood Harris. I mean... Unbelievable. Great dude. So, so in the sourcing of this whole... Um, in the sourcing of this well, whole... Well, I think Jerry West is getting the raw deal. I heard Jerry West was intense. I don't, I... He was intense, but, but like... But like this? You like this is like... It's a little nah, extraordinary. A little... You know what I didn't like? The only thing I did not like in Winning Time... If they gonna show you in that in that in sense of how they showed you, yeah. sh show the build up, show the fucking superstar, right. show the motherfucker that you, you know what I'm saying. Don't don't show him don't show when he only on the decline yeah, or he had a bad yeah. like motherfucker like he, he he was human. He went through a rough. A rough this period. this what we doing? Okay, this show show he was killing it. Well, show he came but in. Guess what? From that showtime, uh, from the from the HBO special mm -hmm. now Lionsgate has came in and bought the Spencer Haywood story mm. for a major motion picture. So we're going to do a series now. Yeah, it's not a, just a series. It's for, made for the theater. I got you. Uh, I got um, uh, Mark Canton, who did 300, do all of the Power series, all that. He owns all gotcha. of that. And Vassell Benford, who owns the, the Power series, all of those those are uh, series, as well as my agent on this is Tobias Harris, dad, Terrell Ooh. Harris. So they're doing the whole movie That's dope. of I my it. life. So you won't just see my down year. Because that was my only down year in the NBA. They took it and rolled with it. But, it, you know, I, I'll tell you. It's compelling. Let's keep it real. Yeah, it's compelling. My story, the and whole story is really compelling listen, because you got Iman, you got I was just about to, industry, I, listen, you got, you are, we are on the same <laughs> wave. I don't even have to tee this up. You know we're not. So I got to gotta ask you this. <laughs> what, are, what is inspired, because right now, and I'm going to set this up for all the viewers who are watching mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. At this time, the league has a real drug problem. Mm -hmm. Multiple players, right? Yeah. But in the category of the box, right, players are in the box. You're outside of the box. You at fashion shows. You date models. I'm not. I, I didn't see this with anybody else. I, you know, I heard guys who womanizing with different chicks. I never heard or never seen them with models. I'm just being honest, bro. You at first. fashion shows. You at operas. You at. You at the. Roo, 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 roo. You at the. You at. You at shit. <laughs> guys are right, are not at. <laughs> What's got you outside of the box? What's got you thinking differently to where you over here and it seems like the league is here? I just wanted something different. I wanted a different life than just basketball. And so when uh, I met Iman, and later we just got, we got married and had children and stuff like that, but in that cycle, in that world, I had, of course, the operas, I had... Uh, I was explaining to someone yesterday about 
the most famous photo shoots that we did together. One was with Lord Snowden, who was married to Queen Elizabeth's sister. Mm. And it was shot in London. And it was like just a fabulous shoot. And then after that, we got together with the Faroya family and just hung out and had dinner and just party and stuff like that. But that whole lifestyle was like totally different. And I, and I enjoyed it tremendously. And, and we were like two lovers. We had, you know, she was from Somalia and was in the fashion world, didn't know a lot of people in America. Right. Uh, I was in New York. I had left my family in Seattle, all of my you know, family and everybody. And I was in New York with the Knicks. So we just cling to each other. And we, we did a lot of things, man. We just went to plays. We did the operas. We did fashion shows galore because she was the number one model in the country at that time. So it was, uh, it was some beautiful stuff, man. man she was I beautiful. Enjoy. I know you did, bro, and it was beautiful. <laughs> I say this to say, too, um, she was universal. Yeah. Kind of the first black supermodel that we all kind of honored and looked at. Um, you know. Spoke not, five languages. Yeah. Um, I say, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, Iman was definitely on my wall. Uh, <laughs> her and the 50 other jet beauties that I had on the back yeah. of my wall, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, if you could be commissioner for a whole year, what would you what would you add to the league? Gosh, I mean, I will add a little bit more pizzazz because the players today, I mean, you can see it in their fashion, their clothing. You can see it because you have the musical aspiration. You have Dame and other guys who are hitting hip hop. You have uh, players who are playing piano and stuff like that. I will let that history of those players be shown a little bit more. Mm. Therefore, you can get a, a total picture of who those players are and what they're all about. And like you said before, I would, I would hype it up a lot more with like the play in like the, the tournament you're talking about in Las mm. Vegas. I would like kick that off with, like you said, red carpet, right. with life and the music and I would like to see the games. Uh, I mean, you see the hip hoppers and the people who are sitting on the sideline, but I mean, I would like to see them just get up on the mic and kick it before the game kick mm. off. You know, a couple of battles, you know? Mm. Yeah, I would. Tap into the music parts of some of yes. these artists and some it's of these right players. It's right there, right there. Right. So you're only talking two minutes or five minutes, so mm. let it happen. I think All Star needs a needs a reboot. I think as I'm watching a lot that's going on in the world, I'm watching one-on-ones. I'm watching the fascination with ones be, be kind of the wave right now. You know, like shout out to Tracy McGrady's one-on-one -on -one, uh, league is doing really well. But just in social media, just in content, I'm watching a bunch of ones go on. You know, whether it's on the blacktop, whether it's in gyms, I'm just watching I would love to see the NBA do an ultimate one-on-one -on -one and see who comes out. Play King of the Hill. You know, we used to do that at the All-Star Game. Oh, no doubt. Oh, hey, listen. So very fun <laughs> and very freely with no cameras, right? Because cameras are everywhere, right? Yeah. We used to mess around. And you know what? Jordan used to run up on you and just and then start guarding you. And you, right. was, and you was in it. You was in yeah. it. And for that little seven seconds, it's real one-on-one. -on -one. It's real one-on-one. -on -one. But we used to have... Uh, in 1972 in Chicago, we had a one-on-one -on -one tournament. Like officially? Officially. Y'all putting bread in or it's just somebody? No, it was, it was part of the All-Star Weekend. Oh, wow. Yeah. Could you, you think something like that could be done today? Yeah, for sure. You, for think, sure. You're, you think you're good players would sign up for the one-on-one? -on -one? That's the problem. And, and I, I know back then, you know, we all signed up for the dunk contest. We, we signed up for everything. Because you wasn't afraid to lose. Right. It wasn't like... And it says something, too, to perform under those lights. Under That's those not lights. for everybody. <laughs> it's not for everybody. So I'm trying it to. wasn't for me because, you know, in, in that All-Star game, I got beat by my own teammate, Barry Clemens. 
What you mean? A one on one. Oh, word? Yeah. And what is it? Straight up one check. Uh, one gotta... on, straight up one on one checks and he beat me, and then uh, he had to play Bob Lanier. Okay, so we play so a knockout. So as you get beat, too. you got to get off. Then yeah, another guy comes in. Next guy come on. So if he miss, you stay on? You stay on. Okay, cool. I see yeah. exactly what it is. So what y'all going to, five, four, seven? I think we was going to 11. Ooh. It's serious? It's serious. Ain't nobody fucking around like it's real. Like no, it was money on the line. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah okay, yeah. so you it's call your own foul? Huh? You calling your own foul? No, we had a referee. Oh, wow. Yes. Ooh. Who won and, that? Uh, I'm not sure. But then later on, they had another one with Will. No, with Kareem. And Dr. J. And Dr. J. I saw that. I saw that. So, Boy, Dr. J looked winded in that, too. He was just, yeah. And I, I that mean, wasn't at the All-Star game. No, no, that so was that some was after. Because those but, are the two most, yeah. But that's, I, I think that would work great in at the All-Star game. Mm. And I think if you let... Everybody participated in the slam dunk contest. Mm. That's, what you, you at, that's what you want to see? You want to yeah. see the streets come in? You I want to see the streets come Ooh, Talk about a little bit about... Uh, I want to see it. Did you ever play at 55th? Did you, yes. ever, did you ever go up in Harlem and play yes. in Harlem? Well, how, Lenny, how important was that? That was so... You said, you was about to say Lenny Wilkins? Lenny Wilkins was telling me, you know, when I was with the Sonics, he said... You know, you wanna you wanna get a little loose. I want you to go up to the Rutgers and play. So I get up to Rutgers and I, I took a, a hotel room for one month at the City Squire in Ooh. in uh, Midtown Manhattan. So you posted up in New York for a whole yeah. month. You wanted to see what it was. I'm gonna be. play. Oh wow! And so I played against all of the players, the helicopter and all of those uh, Manigault and all those players. What's your it thoughts was, when you walk through there? It was. It was, it was like it was just electric. It was electric, and it was like you were going to uh, say today you were going to a rap a rap off, like a rap battle. Yeah. Did it? Did it remind you of Crump? Yeah. So you had been there. I had, so you been, had there been there in Saint Cecilia. Oh yeah. Yeah. Saint. So it was Shout like to the Saint. Ooh. And they were like, you know, everybody wanted to play above the rim, and I was like. That's my area, too. So I was playing it above the rim. And then I get a call from Sonny Hill, who says, well, you're going you're gonna to stay up in New York, or are you going to come down here and meet some real players? You're a Philly boy. So I said, well, hey, <laughs> this is nothing but a train ride for right, me. You ain't so I shit. packed my bags and went to the Baker League, played mm. with Sonny and them boys. Who's down there? Who's uh, down there? You Philly had... Chet Walker, you had um, uh, Wilt came by, but he didn't play that much. He just, he, oh, he he just was, watching? He was just watching, and he, he said, hey, who is the young boy? And stuff like that. And you had... Um, Cunningham, then? They, they yeah. Like, they you, had, young. You, know, you had um, Luke Jackson. I remember mm. big Luke Jackson. Yeah, was like Jackson. And Harold so Greer. Hal Greer. Uh, all of those guys Ooh. were down there, and I was like, yeah, I'm in school now. They had some game? Yeah, they had game, and they was playing the professor-type game, you know. Like that Princeton backdoor, two yeah, dribble hands off, one dribble like pull up. Right over here, and then backdoor, uh, and you're like, wait a minute. Koozie shit. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so that was cool. Who had You the, got my spot in, in Boston, you know. I got your spot? Yeah. Red Arback, he just now came out, and, I mean, this story is out now about him saying the one player that got away from me out of the four guys that got away from the Celtics was Spencer Haywood. I was mm. like, KG got my shit. <laughs> you more Laker than you more Laker than Celtic, though. I know, I know, I know. You way more Laker than Celtic. <laughs> I know. So, you know, you know, Lakers always shiny, shiny. It's always glitty. glossy. It's always sunshine. <laughs> the bean is always dirty. Got some grit on it. Yeah, <laughs> the bean is. <laughs> uh. Man, thank you for coming through, Shout, man. Um, I know it's something. Did, did I miss anything? It's a, I just to, it's, it's a thousand things in my head. Context to what you said. So, 1972, the one-on-one tournament, fifteen thousand dollar prize pool. Uh, they played by twos to twenty. You had to win by four. Damn. The finals was Bob Lanier versus JoJo White. Bob Lanier won. See? Oh, Bob Lanier. I told you, Bob. He beat Lanier. JoJo White. Yes. Yeah. 
so that that was the finals of the one-on-one -on -one tournament. Uh, from what I gather, it was the only one that happened. I don't think it happened. That didn't happen anymore. No, no, no. But, but yeah, 15 grand and it was all single dollar bills. I think that if you do like, if you get a sponsor to sponsor for like 10 million. Yeah. That's when everybody gonna sign up. That's when you're gonna and get your big boys. And it's easy sale. And it's ones, it's ones, y'all. Yeah. Nobody cares about the prize money. Because when you step out there, you forget about all that. When it's yeah. ones, and I think you should do full court ones. I don't think it should oh, just be, God. you know why? I think you should. Now you in, everybody in shape. Because you know what? You know well, what? what about the big guys? Bro, everybody, man, listen. Sean, put, put your name in the hat. We should do a hat. <laughs> we want some ones, put your name in the hat. Boom. Yeah, yeah. Put them up, boom. Man, uh, okay, we got, ah, uh, ah. Uh, we need to go back to the old school and do it old school. The little piece of paper, fold it up, put it in the hat, straight up, 10 million. Who want to sign up? Yeah. Sign up the first 25. Yeah. Bob Lanier won it, huh? Damn, well, Bob Lanier? At 6'11 versus a guy that was 6'3. I know. No, but, but, jo that, but Jojo, Jojo White was fast. Jojo had a was J, fast. Had he had the J. Man. Wow. I would have loved to see that. Every time I talk to you, Spencer, I learn something new. Man. Or I learn something that I did not know. And I'm a very informative person. And you told me about the Nike situation. So a lot of people don't know this, but Spencer Haywood, like in winning time, they said that Magic was the first to be offered the contract. It was actually Spencer Haywood. Spencer Haywood was offered the very first signature shoe with Nike. And I think the story goes that they didn't have enough money to be able to pay you, so they wanted to pay you in stock. And in today's stock, it would have been equivalent to... 2.1 billion. And the agent, and if I can quote your agent, said, I can't get paid in stock. So we're going to take the money. We're going to take the money. And that was what you did because well, you didn't understand only, stock he does, he and you wasn't financially savvy to understand to the difference. To understand it. It was, this is 1973. So when and I, the, the joke was, that shoe is never going to make it. And that's a shoe for a runner. People not right. equating that the <laughs> one of the things you do shoe. in basketball, you're going to fucking run, bro. You're yeah. going to fucking run. And the first time that I wore the shoe, uh, the players were, were walking up behind me while I'm playing and popped the shoe off. Stepping on the back of your the shoe. The back of the shoe, and the shoe would pop off. Mm. And the coach, Tom Nasalke, I think it was, was coaching Seattle at the time. He was like, you can't play in this shoe. Just dogging it. <laughs> Do dogging it. You got to go through some dog days. The players were saying that the shoe... You know what that shoe looked like? It looks like an upside down Newport cigarette logo. <laughs> so I was so discouraged by my shoe that I was like, okay. And then this guy that was doing the negotiation, he was like, I was giving him some play, a young bro, you know, who was like, I want to get into the business. And I was like, okay do this contract, man. No, I, I got to go play. Mm. And so he, I was on the road, and, he, and I had the power of attorney. He said, I can't pay my rent. I got all these things. Mm. We need to cash this in. <laughs> we need to cash the stock in so I can pay my rent, so I can live a little bit. This year ain't going to never make it. You'll get a contract with Adidas next year. So I said, hey, do what you got to do. Wow. And to this day, when I see Phil Knight, he always look at me like, wow. Yeah. Thank the you owner know. of Nike, because, you yeah, know, we were, we were like, we were young people up in Seattle and Portland. Mm -hmm. So the shoe was not, it wasn't a big shoe across the country. In it that just, area, though. It was just in that area. Because it was all runners, same like Portland and Seattle kind Portland of married each Seattle. other a little bit. And so he said, well, look, we got... Spencer Hayward, that year I was, uh, I finished third behind, uh, it was Kareem, Nate Archibald, and myself going for MVP of the league. So I finished third with those guys. I think Nate or Kareem won it. And so Phil wanted me to, to like bring his shoe to the market. I was like wearing the shoe. It's all good, man. I, I didn't even think about, you know, I didn't even want to charge him anything because he was trying to get the shoe on the market. He was like pushing it out of his trunk and you know all that stuff. So it wasn't really like a big deal. But then you got hindsight and you look into the where it is today and you say, "Wow." Are you shocked to see where it is today? 
No. You knew he had vision from day one? You that knew that he... was vision because of the shoe was like, it was a cool shoe. It was so, suede. Mm. It had, the, you know, a nice feel to it. But I just hate I got talked out of it. And also at the All-Star game that year in 1973, I think we played in L.A. here. Mm -hmm. And Wilt Chamberlain, Jerry West, and Oscar in the locker room. And these guys looking at me like, they were talking trash. They had the superstars on. Yeah, they came they out had, with the superstars. <laughs> had, had the pro, had, had the, the pro joint, on. had the gold joint on the tongue. Yeah, so Terry West said, had his name on this shit. I said, well, I think I'm gonna pull my shoe off and put on a pair of these Adidas. So I played in some Adidas in my All Star appearance in my in my Nikes. So Nike was like, piss. Short-sighted. Short-sighted <laughs> like a mom. I know, but. <laughs> no, I get it. Being the first with all of this stuff, you make some tremendous mistakes. Listen, you're R&D for it all, bro. Yeah. You're, I'm sitting here yeah. being able to have the type of career I could, I could have had yeah. or that I had because of the R&D that went in. I, I say the same things to this day. You look at what these kids are making, that these kids are damn they're gonna be billionaires. Billionaire. Soccer players are billionaires from playing soccer. Right. I never would have thought that, but universally I see how soccer is revered and I see it, right? Yeah. Basketball, football, baseball, it's on its way. It's on its way. I also see how non-guaranteed contracts are coming out of, the, out, of, out of no conversation. You don't really hear about this. You hear about the first two that got, or the first three that got the big number. Yeah. And then the other 12, 13, 14 guys are damn near at the minimum or fighting for a two-year joint, two one year, year joint. Yeah. guaranteed. Like, I'm just, I'm watching it all, Spence. I'm watching, I'm watching how we went through, what, I've been through six lockouts? I've been through six lockouts. Oh, okay, okay. And all those six lockouts have actually got us to where we are today in today's preference of the league and the Players Association having a better continuity. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I'm God. seeing how they're working yeah, better yeah, together, how it's, how it's flowing better, right? Until this TV deal comes out. Woo! I've been asking everybody this. I think I asked this This TV week. deal is going to be... Tell me what you think this TV deal is. You, you've seen this whole thing. From, I've seen it from the beginning. When it wasn't on TV, when y'all was being... We'll, we'll take delay on take fucking delayed. CBS and y'all was played at two in the morning. Two My the uncle morning. here eating cereal, making noise and watching the fucking game. <laughs> Real shit. Yeah. So you've seen it go from radio to goddamn TV, TV, TV. TV. Now TV. the social media, now social. streaming, and now we at, so... Yeah. This next TV deal is... What is it going to be? Maybe three billion? Shit, this goes. This, maybe it's close to three already right now. It's close to three oh, no, now? No, 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 no. This, yeah, this, this TV deal is going to be probably 150, maybe 100 billion. Yeah. No one's talking about streaming. Nobody's talking about how to monetize the streaming. Nobody's talking about the, the inflection of how betting is taking the game and actually growing, how the insurance and betting alone is taking it and skyrocketing it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Betting's about to become a whole nother, a whole nother thing. The interaction, the... the yeah. The, the incentives that come with the, 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 not just for the enjoyment of loving basketball, but yeah. you knowing what you know and incentives and knowing how game flows, being able to, you know, partake in betting. And man, are you, are you, when you look up, drugs was a problem in the league. You couldn't bet in the league. Now, if you're in the <laughs> league, you can, you, you can smoke. You can smoke. Hey, I can, I can put a parlay on the wall, on a parlay. I can. Yes. I want to know your thoughts. And as you look at today, it's like, boy. You was, you was born too early, man. I was born too early, but if I had been born in, uh, one second later, this whole thing would not have... Absolutely. It would been, not be. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah man, so, I, I probably would have disappeared, boy, if you didn't go yeah. through all this real shit. So, I look at it all as like, my gosh, I'm still around. I'll be 75 on my next birthday. That's what's up, man. And I've seen it all. I've seen... Drug abuse in the in, <clears throat> mm. in the 70s and the early 80s. I've seen it flip around because David and I, David Stern and I, we had a long, long talk about that whole process at that time because he was like, Spencer, I hate to do this, but you got to leave the league for a year. And they put me, exiled me into Venice, Italy, which was nice. But not a bad we place. Talk, no, not a no. bad place to rehab, I tell you that. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> ah. Yeah. And so I played some serious ball over there. And then to, we were talking just before he passed about 
how the league has grown and how I participated and how I made it, helped to make it what it is today. And we just sit there and we sort of cried a little bit, man, on each other's shoulder because we started out together. I was about to say, David Wait. Stern, a lot of people don't know, man. He, he was the first commissioner to me that valued relationships. And he didn't want those relationships to be uh, public. And he worked better in the shadows. Yeah. He was, a, he was an operator. He was a doer. And uh, he was up on his shit, yo. I like to think that um, by the time Adam came into places where I felt like I had dealt with Adam on, a, on the early stage of negotiating, mm -hmm. you know, with the lockouts and stuff, so you kind of see, like, the worst part of, parts of each other. You know, you do that. Yeah. But then also, you grow a little respect in those meetings because there's only but so many people in those meetings and only so many people are talking. Right. And if you're talking, you got to know exactly what you're talking what about. What you're talking about. And it's got to be respected. Yeah. Or no one in the room hears you. So Adam and I kind of built a little continuity just between. He loves you. I fucks with Adam, man. He's good people, man. Yeah. He is. He loves me, too. And he, that's why I'm like, why do you know, love us, too? Because the commissioner. What the hell is going you know, on here? You, know, you know, the commissioner's not supposed to be loving nobody. You You're know not what I'm supposed saying? to love it's us. It's changing. <laughs> it's changing. He's changed the mechanism of, yeah. of how that whole dynamic is. But I say this to say about, uh, you know, the great David Stern, man. The, the way he built the league from business mm -hmm. at times was a fuzzy, was a fuzzy vision. And I'm not saying I, he, I was a fan of how he did a lot of things. I wasn't king on him trying to step on hip hop. I wasn't king on him trying to rebrand the black man. I wasn't, I wasn't oh, feeling yeah. that. But when he explained what he was trying to do from his perspective and how to do it, right. he thought, well, when I had to go get a job, I had to put a suit on and dress up and play the part as I was going <laughs> to get the job. If I'm taking us into China and places and, and, and into the Asian world where, you know, we're going to get some new uh, uh, licensing, licensing pro, license agreements. Address, uh, man, it's going to grow the game. Grow the game. We're going to grow your brand. We're going to grow. I, I need everybody dressed up. I need everybody to look the part. And that's when I was like, oh, well, why you didn't say that? Versus trying to take AI off the cover, strip him of right. his shit. Uh, I, and then that's when it was David. Oh, I don't have to ask you guys. And then I'm like, yeah, well, actually you do, motherfucker. He then, got a little arrogant in there. Uh, ain't no but... little nothing, you know? He, he's, he's David Stern. <laughs> but I, I, I found that he respected when you had a voice. I respected that he followed the wave. When he sat down with Al to have the, the we conversation, he knew that it was time to have that conversation. He was, he was right on time with that one. He Very was strategic. like, I knew... I, got, I have to have this conversation. The genius. And yeah. what I'm seeing in winning time is all of what I know of what I've learned from the OGs talking to me and what I've heard. Him sitting down at the table, and it happened to be Dr. J, Larry Bird, <laughs> Magic Johnson, yourself, Kareem, <laughs> and then, boom, you're having dinner. And just so happened Jerry Buss is at the same meeting. Yeah. Like, and then I think Isaiah Thomas may be at that meeting or at that table. But I'm saying that those are the pillars. Those are the guys that were real alphas. Those were real men that can, con not control, but can get men to can follow get them. men to follow, yeah. Men that were respected. Yeah. In that, you know what I'm saying? Made the fraternity like this. Yeah, but I sure was mad at him when, when I was kind of circled as the guy of the 80s. But I understood it because I said, well, you know, I did do the damage. If you gave yourself a reason to be the reason, then he didn't mind putting the reason on you. Right. And you know what? So I accepted you it know because what? I had to carry the load. Not anyway. even though. He know your background. He that know your, he know that back. You know, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Don't have me going to this moose of shit. Right. That's the same thing. You get the target on your back because, one, you're the one that can take it. Take you understand it. what I'm saying yeah. to you? And I was the example because, you know, I had the wife, I had the fashion, I had all you of had the, the glitch. glitch. You had the, what everything. everybody wanted so, to be like, but didn't nobody want to say it. You understand? Nobody want to say it. Yeah. Thank you for coming on here today, man. This it's is always awesome, a pleasure, man. man. You already know. Every time we get together, it's electric. This is electric, man. Thank Joe. you. Man, thank you. I appreciate you, man. Appreciate you. Certified today, man. The great Smith Certified. Hayward, y'all. Let's get it. <laughs>
two kings. One throne. No mercy. Championship hard on display. Canelo versus Charlo for the undisputed world title. Saturday, September 30th, live on pay-per-view.